This month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by seven awesome individuals. Illuminati, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Greg Ross, 36 Dingo, Lindsay Trebet, and Michael Fritchie. If you want to become a patron, go to wheredotheroadgo.com. Thank all of you for your generous support and enjoy the show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I'm joined by Mr. Joshua Cutchin. Greetings. Who has a cold. Yeah, I'm going to try to power through, so... (laughs) <laughs> leave leave your pithy comments below, folks. <laughs> Taylor. Sure you will. Hey, how's it going? And that's just Taylor. There's no other name attached there. Just Taylor. Yep, just Taylor. <laughs> uh, and uh, for the first time ever, Mr. Matt Festa. Hello. Thank you for having me. And uh, Matt Matt has been a regular on uh, The Last Exit for the Lost, and I've, I've been trying very desperately to get him to join us because he's witty funny and no stuff so matt do you oh have yeah any... don't set the bar too high. no i'm not i'm not <laughs> matt do you have any nephews or nieces uh not by but i've got a few friends that have little ones that i consider okay. nephews and nieces so, do, do they call you uncle festa oh wow <laughs> i've never heard that before josh Bravo. Incredible. Wait, are you serious really <laughs> i can't tell if he's being sarcastic either yeah i, I can't either yeah. when have i ever been sarcastic Soraya? How okay he's being about? sarcastic you're all right <laughs> Man, that's what we're starting the show with. Well, you know, with my last name, I so rarely get a chance to poke fun at other people's last names. So, sorry. You mean Crut? I mean, Crutchin is such a common last name. <laughs> oh, I've heard Kuchin and, and mm. uh, you know, Cutchinson and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah. Interesting. I would just type Crutchin. I knew it was Cutchin, but I would type Crutchin. Crutchin. So, there you go. Clearly, it's meant to be Crutchin. So anyway, uh, Matt is actually doing the art for my my uh, autobiography whenever that gets done. And by that, I mean the book, not the art. He's going to finish the art long before the book, I think. Any decade now. <laughs> but you can check out his art where? Uh, my artwork is up on Instagram and Facebook. Both of them are under my studio name, Tiamat's Garden. Yeah. And some seriously awesome detailed stuff. Oh, thank you. That's a sweet name, too. Yeah. Yeah. Tiamat's Garden is definitely. Uh, okay, so I had we we're just gonna do a wandering the road show, um, and uh, I figured we start with some comments I have here. Um, this one, uh, th- this was just a cool comment, and so this it made me happy, so I wanted to read it on the air. Uh, so, uh, waves and waves on YouTube said, "Do you know there are people having lunchtime conversations about this show in Dundee, New Zealand? That's paranormal in my books." Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of one time that I <laughs> I um made a meme and I saw it was shared in, I can't remember where it was. I feel like it was probably Australia. And I said to my friend, it made it all its way to Australia. And he's like, Josh, it's the internet. <laughs> I, still, I still thought it was, but I still thought it was cool. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. We, we actually do have a lot of listeners in New Zealand and, and Australia, uh, as well as the UK, Canada, and the U S and then scattered around the rest. And I'm thinking yeah. probably because that's mostly the English-speaking, you know, primary English-speaking countries. So sure, that makes sense. It's always interesting to see too when you look at like analytics on a podcast how like just incredibly all over the place um, they can be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's fun. Um, I I thanked them for that comment, and they said, uh, "You and your buddies are some of the the smartest, funniest, kind people out there. You don't make fun of people, and you take everyone as they are and fully listen to them." And by doing that, people can feel like they can talk to the talk truth about high strangeness. Uh, you get to some really cool stuff, the really far out stuff, and those things don't normally go together. But you make it work, and it kicks ass. So uh, yeah, thank you, waves and waves, uh, because that that is pretty much exactly what we're trying for. I mean, there's it's rare. I mean, there was there were some people upset, of course, every time we do a disclosure show, um, and that's usually because we're saying it's all BS. Well, you know, it occurred to me, I read a comment on YouTube that was something to the effect of like, well, why aren't you as skeptical about you know, tales of fairies and Kundalini and stuff? And my answer for that is really simple. 
it's because the people telling us stories about fairies and Kundalini are in charge of making policy. Like, yeah, it's yeah, really, it's really hard to weaponize fairy stories or Kundalini stories. And what you come down to at the end of the day is like, I, I tend to believe experiencers, but when you get whistleblowers or government uh, agents or ex-military in the mix, I do cast a, a more uh, critical eye because, again, like the, the potential for you know misuse, I think, is greater. So that doesn't mean that they're not yeah. telling the truth. That doesn't mean that they're not saying things that they think is the truth. It doesn't mean that, for all we know, it is the truth. Um, but at the same time, I think you, you do sort of need to be a little bit more cautious because you know, they are in control of or in touch with people who control the levels, the levers of power. You know? Yeah. And the narrative. The, yeah, there's, there's a similar thing too, when you're looking at a story told by somebody who's, you know, ultimately doing that to sell a book, for instance, some like the contactee sort of stuff. But when you're talking to just an individual who's telling you a personal story, I think there's a very different thing going on. Right. Yes, exactly. And a lot of times people don't want notoriety for their experience. They just want to talk to somebody about it. Yeah. So it's not so much like, oh, well, that's crazier than this. It's 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 also with the disclosure stuff, the fact that it's just like this cycle that just keeps uh, repeating. And s- someone said we sounded annoyed last time. And I'm thinking, yeah, a little bit, because <laughs> we just keep doing the same show and the same. it's the same outcome every time. I mean, oh, yeah, the disclosure and, and, shows are like an annual event now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like how many how many times do you have to go through the same process before you just kind of either you do one of two things. You either tune it out, which is most of what I do, or you become cynical. And, you know, when you're on a show like this, you kind of have to talk about it because everybody's expecting you to talk about right. it. Of course, you become cynical because how many times have you been promised the smoking gun? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we've we've gotten various degrees of 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 firearm residue <laughs> to extend the metaphor. Um, but we, but we still don't have that smoking gun yet. And, you know, I, it just, it always sort of befuddles me how people think that a lot of the things that are being claimed are open and shut cases and they're decided. And they're really not like we, we have an idea of what people in high positions of power think the phenomenon is. And we have people who have had experiences tell us what the phenomena has told itself. It is, but in my opinion, both of those are unreliable sources, both sure. you know authority figures and the phenomenon itself. So I, <laughs> yes. I think it's still there's still a lot more questions on the table, and I think at this point, it really could still be anything the UFO phenomena. And, and it's probably many things. Well, yeah, I, I always say that, and then you always say that, and I always feel like an idiot for not <laughs> for not leading that way. But, well, I know that's what yeah. you mean, though, too. Yeah, because there's clearly not one answer for all this unexplained stuff. Right. There, there are connections, certainly, but I mean, in the end, there's going to be a lot of different explanations. I, you know, to me, I'm just suspicious. You know, like like this guy that, that came out. I can't remember his name. Grush was that it? That the latest? It's, it's G R U S C H. So I believe Grush, I believe. Okay, so I had said something like, you know, real whistleblowers end up in jail, and someone said, well, he cleared all this stuff. And I'm like, well, then he's not whistleblowing. You know, like what? That's not, you know. <laughs> Um, so let's see, uh, I had reposted, uh, the strange lights series of, uh, episodes we did on strange light phenomena. And Josh, you were on one of those, one of the two parts, I think. And cause, okay. cause I think initially you were supposed to be on the first one and something happened. Uh, and Jeff Ritzman was on the first one and wasn't on the second one. Cause I don't think he could do the second one, but you were on the second one. So I took all four of those shows. It was like, we did two on strange lights and then two on all the feedback we got about it. And I just put them in one show and posted it because I think that's an that's an interesting uh, that was a really good series of shows. I want to do the same thing with the uh, sleep paralysis ones. Uh, but some uh, David Wood had written me and said uh, my strange light experience. This literally happened a couple of weeks ago, uh, the 11th of June. I write these things down in my dream journal. I'd gone out to a nearby field. I live in a suburban area. The field is part of a nature reserve, and there's a river and a well-used footbridge nearby. I'd gone out mainly to enjoy the cool evening at Skywatch. Uh, as almost a month, 16th of May, before I saw a UFO fly low over the area. Uh, actually, I saw two UFOs that night at the same time. Back to the 11th of June, not much had been happening. I had had a cider with me and was enjoying that, as well as trying to connect whatever to whatever was out there. First strange thing, not sure if this was a trick of a light, I saw something appear out of nowhere and drop down into the tall grass in front of me. It was about two meters away, bird-like shape and size, and whitish transparent. There was no noise or movement of the grass. 
Directly after this, some flashing in the reddish color all over Halo around the clouds lasted about two to three seconds. It was enough to make me go, what the F was that? It made me jump. After this, I felt a really strong heat around me, the kind of heat you would feel from an electric stove. And there was uh, also a smell of burning or singeing, thankfully not me. Uh, the, sh- the smell lasted for about five seconds. The only other thing was a, a large clearing above me in the clouds, almond-shaped. I did see a light far off in the distance, but it looked more like a satellite. The UFOs I saw previously, I was walking home after meeting with someone in a pub, only had one pint, and I was disappointed with the meeting, but chose to let my feelings go and was then in a much more peaceful mindset. I approached the river, which is next to the field and nature reserve I mentioned. I was enjoying the view and thinking how much I loved looking at the woods at night and how lucky I was to have them nearby. This is when I saw two UFOs off to my right, both different and di- in different places. One was much higher up in the sky, whitish yellow ball of light. It dropped down at an angle and then made a little curve upwards like a J shape and then it disappeared. The other UFO was much lower, I'd say 150 to 200 feet above the field I mentioned earlier. It went from the right to the left quite slowly. It was a large, bright, whitish blue light, but I could see some structure there. Uh, If I were to give it a shape, this sounds silly, I would say a shorter version of an X-wing fighter, and I could see some X, like the thing on it, and front narrowing to a point. Uh, I went to the bridge nearby. It was still traveling in the same direction, and I watched as it moved onwards. It could be seen for some time. Yep, I should have taken a photo, but I don't have any faith in my camera phones, and I had no missing time. Yeah, nobody ever, nobody ever really does end up taking a photo. At least not too often. It does happen. And if but. they, and if they do, it's a blurry white blob well, yeah. or something. I heard a great response one time at a conference to that. Somebody asked the panelist, you know, why are there aren't why aren't there any better photos of this stuff? And uh, there's this old self admitted cat lady in the audience, and she's like, I have twelve cats, and Mister. Mr. Grumpy is the hardest one to ever find. And you know what? I have pictures of all my cats except for Mr. Grumpy. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's kind of kind of a good point. Like, if something doesn't want to be seen or you just catch it fleetingly, then, you know. Yeah, yeah. Could be a reason for it. Well, that's so a- the obvious conclusion is that Mr. Grumpy is piloting the UFOs. Mr. Grumpy is piloting the UFOs. <laughs> I think you just solved the UFO enigma. It's cats. I can't wait for Mr. Grumpy disclosure. <laughs> Get out a laser pointer. And call down. That's why the laser pointers work, to call down the UFO. Wait, isn't that what Stephen Greer does? Yeah, it is, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not exclusively what he does, and I, I am probably more charitable to the CE5 protocols than a lot of people, but... Yes, that is among among the techniques. <laughs> yeah, well, the techniques he's using do tend to work. That's the thing. I mean, whatever we're dealing with, it's just he puts a... a well, first of all, price tag on it, but also, um, you know, uh, a, a uh, camouflage to it. Like, oh, that's the mothership. That's this. That's that. Rather than just being, look at this interesting phenomena that you can yeah, do on and, your and, own. You don't have to be out here with us. And, and when you're guaranteeing someone an experience, it does incentivize uh, willful misidentification. And it also, you know has the potential to incentivize i'm not saying this happened but happens but it also has the potential to incentivize fabrication of results so that people feel like they got their money you know yeah oh yeah do you, do you mean so, like the, the customers or the the viewers um willfully buying into that kind of fiction or, or narrative or do you mean on behalf I, of I, th- I think he sells it well i yeah. mean there there have been accusations of of both those things coming from from greer you know that that he points out points out things that are obviously space station and satellites and claims that they're ufos or that he somehow orchestrates things i again like i said i'm probably more charitable than most people regarding that um but but you know two things can be true at the same time right there's a potential for fraud but also the techniques can work on their own because i've talked to too many people who have seen genuinely strange stuff that doesn't sound like it's misidentification or absolutely that the wool's being pulled over their eyes and and i and i think when he investigated that 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 alien mummy i think he was genuine in trying to find out what it was it's just he just kind of buried the lead when he found out it was human um but it's not like he just like left that out of the documentary or anything so i I think i think there's there's some honesty there but i think it's also you know this is this is how he makes a lot of money so yeah it's hard it's hard to kind of not you know, dive deep into that as soon as you have a following around it. Yeah. Yeah. Back, 
back to the story uh, that was shared there. That's an amazing, um, yes, an amazing story. And it like, it has so many things that I kind of want to comment on, but I feel like they're, they're probably old hat to the where to the road go audience well, by this point, <laughs> um, but do it anyway for okay, people who well, are know, new. Well, you know, the X wing thing sounds absurd, but, uh, but if, that's if just... the, if the, if the phenomenon is co-creative, then that could be part of it. You know, there are also those stories about, um, people like, Neil Gaiman meeting his characters and, uh, yeah. you know, the famous, uh, the famous John Constantine with, um, Oh, Alan Moore, um, meeting John Constantine. So, you know, the, the idea that it could look like something like that completely ties in with the idea that the phenomenon is self negating, like the late Jeff Ritzman appropriately enough often said, and also like, uh, George P. Hansen said, um, you know, the fact that there was something resembling a bird that sort of, was in the vicinity and was kind of odd um, ties into a lot of my work in ecology of souls about the bird soul um, being, mm -hmm. you know, the birds being psychopomps, but also birds being a universal symbol for the soul. And, you know, Carl Jung argued that the um, totality of the UFO itself was kind of perhaps a symbol of the soul. Um, and then the burning smell, like, you know, it's always, it's often, I should say, it's often smells of, of combustion that you get in a lot of these uh, encounters of various sorts. Um, and there was you know. heat, too. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting that he said it wasn't him. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. him burning. Which is kind of because it's kind of like I've, I've heard, you know, I have heard that there are people who undergo radiation treatment for cancer and they say that they can actually smell um, themselves uh, in that process. Yeah. Uh, it's just a very dark, sobering thing to hear, but like, it does kind of make you wonder, yeah, you think it wasn't you, but you know, it, it depends. <laughs> I don't want to make you paranoid, <laughs> but it, yeah. it depends. Um, yeah. And then well, the all yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say on the topic of the, the X wing, you know, um, one, it certainly could be, you know, something, uh, either like co-creation related or that it, that it literally was, um, pulling from that kind of, uh, like cultural memory, um, but I could also see it being something that, you know, being a way to describe what you're seeing um, with what you know, where so, you know, I've I've um, seen right. something strange in the sky. And the best way I knew how to describe it was as sort of like a fighter jet folded in half. But that's not really what it looked like. Right. But that's it's you know, it's, <laughs> that's the memory that was evoked in in my mind. So it's like the the closest thing I could go to. To convey it to other people so i don't know if if you know i mean only the listener could really i guess tell us no whether I, it was, I think that, yeah yeah i think that's spot on i mean like you know one of the things that <clears throat> ren said that he saw in his youth ren collier um mm -hmm. is a po polygonal tiger yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Woods. and it's like you know it probably is it's you know again language tends to fail in these encounters and you know the other thing is since it was seen in close proximity that was on the same occasion as the ball of light that went up in the j right did i hear that correctly well yeah, they, they, like. yeah they, they mean, were, uh that might have been the month before so okay well i guess there's still even with that sort of span of time there's still the potential that this was an unorthodox terrestrial craft sort of looking into the strangeness in the area, you know, if it was in the same general area, it seems possible. It could be. Uh, I mean, it doesn't behave like a terrestrial craft from the description. Well, that's why I said unorthodox, right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's Fair. like when, when they, when people were seeing the stealth bomber back in the, whatever it was, the eighties and they were mistaking it for a UFO, kind of that sort of thing, because there wasn't anything that really looked quite like that. And what were you going to say about the almond shaped thing? I mean, I was going to go all academic fart sniffy and say that it was the Vesca Pisces and that it had all sorts of symbols and, you know, associations <laughs> with that or the all seeing eye or something along those lines. But then I, I thought better of it until you dredged it back out of me. So there you go. <laughs> folks. Um, so speaking of birds, the, 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 one of the bird things I had is that, uh, when I was, uh, dating the girl who had like massive amounts of Kundalini as well. Uh, every time I would take her home, in the middle of the winter, these little white birds would fly out of the ditches around my house. And uh, she she was working at one of the colleges, and she went over to the bird department, and she asked them, like, what what kind of birds are these? And after she got done describing them, the guy's like, that, those don't exist. Really? <laughs> yeah, so we have no idea what the hell we were seeing. Could you describe them? They were just small, little white birds, pure white. And I mean, this is with snow on the ground and everything else. And we would be driving mm -hmm. along at night and they would just dart out of the ditches and fly away. Yeah. Like and, tiny, like, like finch sized or like, I'm not sure how big a finch is, honestly. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> but small, they were small and they were very, very fast. 
Yeah, so I'm going to say this, and it's going to sound kind of weird, but um, on this show, well, I mean, but okay, but like you know, so there was the there was the whole birds aren't real meme that was going around. Which yes. Is, oh, I loved that. <laughs> yeah, it was funny, right? Um, but in all seriousness, birds are odd. Um, and you look at you know the confluence of birds appearing at people's deaths, which is uh, Peter Fenwick has studied at length in the near death experience literature. You look at the incidence of, I believe, large stork-like birds appearing in the vicinity of the um, Stanford research remote viewing stuff um, mm-hmm. that appeared. They appeared in conjunction with miniature UFOs. Um, Barbara Fisher's told a story where she saw a UFO and her mother saw a bird and swore that it was a bird. Um, there are a couple of other stories I've collected here and there of, U- of UFOs turning into birds. And then you have all this, like, you know, weird death symbolism and all the stuff that I alluded to earlier. And it's it, you kind of walk, you kind of come away with the feeling of, of birds being something more than they are recognized as, I guess is the way to put it. Hmm, that's interesting. Which again, which again, like, you know, that, just like Mike Cleland acknowledges the fact that owls are just what they seem to be. Um, sometimes the owls are not what, what they, they seem. seem yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that could also be like just part of the collective, you know, cultural bank of metaphors and that birds, you know, literal birds, not necessarily being an aspect of the other, but like just they've always occupied that like unique space within our collective unconscious just because they are like between the literal physical space of like us down here and up in the sky. And like even just like going back to like Renaissance art and that, like when you look at any of the angelic figures that were depicted with wings, they've like never actually been described that way. The wings themselves were just like a visual metaphor because you as the viewer were like taking the vantage point of God and able to see that otherness within them alongside the regular people. Right. And, you know, we, we've always had sort of bird envy, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like we've always been envious of of the way that birds can fly like they do. And this is something, again, that George George Hansen said in his tricks from the Paranormal book is that, you know, birds were often regarded as sort of messengers between realms because they did occupy that in-between space, you know, between us and, and the supernal realm. So... Yeah, how much of that is actually, you know, how much of that's the phenomenon and how much of that is, to sound pretentious again, reified folklore, um, and how much of that is uh, people's expectations, you know, that's that's really what the real question comes down to. I, I do remember, um, Soraya, we talked with, I think we talked with Tim Renner about him walking along Toad Road at one point and him seeing a large white shape Yes. That he thought he gave him the impression of a bird, like a silent bird just sort of swooping out. Um, and I can't remember what episode that was. And yeah. he probably has talked about it since on Strange Familiars. But I do remember him saying that, which is the the first, the very first thing I thought when I heard this story. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, his was bigger, though, wasn't it? It was um, because it was sort of like it was occupying that. I think it might have been when he thought he might have seen a moose. It might have been that same incident. I don't know yeah. if you recall that, too. Yeah, um, yeah, even, though there, even though there aren't moose in Pennsylvania, and he realized right. that. Except, uh, um, well, that, how big was the bird in this story? I'm sure, was it, I, I, I must have missed that part. They were tiny birds. No, no. Well, oh, no, in, I'm talking about in the, in the story that was shared. Oh, uh, hang on a second. I don't think they, I don't think they really said how okay. big. Uh, bird-like shape. So... Uh, I saw something appear out of nowhere and drop down into the tall grass in front of me. It was about two meters away. Bird-like shape and size, whitish transparent. So he didn't say how big it was. So, so my mind would default to like, you know, I don't know, a few inches, six inches, something like that. Right. And, and, and that, sort of, size. that sort of whitish transparent description puts me in the mindset, too, of have you heard these like uh, these uh, amoeba manta ray stories yes. that people have been, no. have been seeing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Flying, flying translucent manta ray stories. I don't remember Lon Strickler talking about them on Phantoms and Monsters like ages ago. And of course that, you know, looks further back to that Trevor James Constable critters, sky critters thing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, Sorry. I said, don't let me, don't let me overshare tonight, folks. <laughs> I'm trying to compensate for how, how bad I feel. I'll, I'll uh, have to look up this, this mantis thing. Yeah. Well, I'm, there's that, there's another the thing manta, like that. Like a manta. Manta ray. ray yeah. Oh, manta. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Mantas. I see. Well, they're, they're, they're there's, yeah, the, the, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say um, the biggest collection I ever read of like those, you know, sky manta ray jellyfish type sightings is the cosmic pulse of life 
which is, you know, great as a resource for a collection of those type of stories, but was like desperately in need of an editor. <laughs> that happens, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I will, I plan on doing a, a separate video on this. Um, but this, I just want to read this part now and I'll, I'll get to it again then I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, I got a copy of the new John dies at the end book. And I'll get into some of the the other stuff about this, but there is one quote in this that I absolutely loved. Um, and they're talking about how Dave and John can see things that other people can't. And for the most part, it's things from another dimension. Um, and uh, they're talking about John, uh, Dave's girlfriend, Amy, and says, if given enough time, she probably could. It was a skill one could acquire with practice, the way mechanics can tell what, what uh, repairs your car needs just by looking about at how expensive your shoes are. Uh, seeing these entities had nothing to do with the anatomy of the human eye and everything to do with how the mind chooses to store memories. You might see it, but won't remember seeing it, even while you're looking at it. If you find that hard to grasp, keep in mind that you've forgotten 99.99% of, of your life up to this point. Can you remember the face of a single cashier you've ever interacted with? Huh. Interesting. And whereas I could say yes, because there are some cashiers I've interacted with multiple times. <laughs> right. For the most part, it's a very good point. You know, you, you deal with people on an everyday basis and they don't stick in your memory because, you know, you interacted with them for what, two minutes? Yeah. Or even, or even events and yeah. even stuff that you do and say, there's a lot of stuff people will do <laughs> like creative projects that you work on and then you, you know, move on. And then years later or months later you revisit and you're like, Oh yeah, I completely forgot about that. There have been many times where I've found stuff I've written, not realized it was me read it went, Oh, I yeah. like that. Oh, yep. I wrote it. Okay. Well that, that explains why I liked it. <laughs> But at I the same, yeah, yeah. At the same time, I'm impressed. I'm like, wow, I actually that, that's written really well, huh? Can I can I still write like that? Yeah, I've had the exact same feeling. <laughs> I mean, me too. Yeah, sometimes I, I get this way when I'm uh, listening to less so the experiencer uh, encounters and people were calling that because obviously something like that would stick in your mind really well. But when they go back and they talk to people especially in true crime about where they remember somebody else being or where they were. I'm, I always think to myself, man, I'm going to be so screwed if, this, if I ever need to have this amount of recall, because I can't usually remember what happened two or three days ago yeah. you know, in that sort yeah. of granular detail. But, you know, these people are always like, I know I went to, you know, Cassandra's because I needed three cups of sugar because I was making, you know, it's just always so <laughs> specific. And I'm just like, I don't know. I woke up and I breathed and I, Eight and I went to sleep. <laughs> I, I I have a friend who remembers things based on when albums were released. Oh, interesting. And he'll just you know you, you'll say say he'll be like, well that would have been 1997 because this band put out their record on July 15th and I was doing this and we we're like interesting new mom new mon you know pneumatic uh, memory device there. Yeah, I, I would imagine that a a, a mnemonic device. Uh, like that would be much more valuable pre-internet. I think that's part of my problem is that I'm just so swamped with information all the time that it all sort of starts to blur together for me at least. Sure. But I, I, well, everybody, I go ahead. Uh, everybody has different ways of remembering things, but also, you know, there, there are some things I think like in my life, for instance, I can, I can think of some specific events that I remember a decent amount of detail, like weird little details, like what I was wearing or who I was with or whatever. And then there's, you know, plenty of other times where and I think part of it is the stuff that's fairly routine that just gets filtered right out. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I couldn't tell you what shirt I was wearing a week ago. Right. Or whatever. The uh, and and the fact that when he says you you don't remember ninety nine percent of your life, I mean that's that's not that much of an exaggeration because you know at, at, when you're young everything's novel, everything's new. <laughs> you remember that stuff when you're young, but when you start getting into routines and you're doing the same stuff every day, there's no reason for you to keep that that memory fresh. Like you yep. you, you have less and less novel. No matter what you do, you're going to have less and less novel experiences as you get older. Which is also my explanation for why people think it feels like time passes quicker when you get older, because you just don't remember most of the stuff you're doing anymore. So if you want time to seem like it's going slower, do a lot of novel things. Oh, I thought you were going to say stay young forever. <laughs> It'll keep you young forever. <laughs> um, and mentally, it helps keep you young. I mean, honestly, I mean, that's what they're, they, they, you know, there have been studies looking at things like Alzheimer's and dementia and showing that people who learn, continue learning new things are less susceptible to it. 
So yeah, novel experiences yeah, so. are, are a positive thing for the most part. And unfortunately, our world tends to push us toward routine. I and, feel like the human experience tends to do that just in general. Maybe. Like, and, and yeah, it is definitely a big part of it. It's definitely, you know, culture and the world we live in. But there's, I think there's a part of just the way that we live. And I think, I think it's, you know, other animals probably have a lot of that too. True. Um, so I'm, true. I'm curious what kind of what kind of memories, you know, certain other types of animals might have. Yes. Yeah. I, I wish we could tap into that information. Yeah. How, how do, how do the cats fly the UFOs? Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's so routine. They don't even remember. <laughs> Uh, and, so is this John dies at the end book? Is this a new one in the series or is it yes. a, like a remaster? No, okay. it's, it's, gotcha. uh, it's called, if this book exists, you're in the wrong universe. Okay. That sounds familiar. Yeah. So, um, like I said, I'm going to do a video on the whole thing. Um, because there, there's a few points in it that are really good, uh, that I wanted to bring out, but that one right now I felt kind of applied to what we were talking about. So I wanted to read that. Um, and the book's great. Honestly, I couldn't put it down. Mm. It's good. So uh, I'd just like to say, you know, sorry, I was just going to say, I'd like to say, given that specific example from the book, as someone who spends like a significant portion of their working life as a cashier, I really hope no one remembers me. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are definitely cashiers I've remembered and some of them that, you know, that for, you know, people just stand out sometimes, but yeah, most cashiers, you know, they're just people. They're just, they're they're, they're they, they they they're there for a moment and gone. Your brain says, "I don't need that information," so it doesn't get retained. Now, Matt, Matt, Matt's a scary guy, so they they all remember him. Thank you? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I had uh, this one here, and this came from Jack Huntington, and he said, uh, "I've also had." It was one of the shows we were talking about dreams. He said, I've also had shared dreams with a person I met in a dream world years before meeting them in material in the material world. Uh, the first time she started telling me about her dream, which was my dream from the previous night, I just started repeating, oh my God, over and over. It felt like a reality rug pull, very disorienting, for several minutes, and then I was okay. That shifting sensation was my belief system expanding. Ha ha. Uh, a few nights later, she told me about the dream she'd had last night about being in a flying car over some desert. And I said, yeah, the headlights were green. And she said, yeah. And we were both silently stunned. That essentially confirmed that this was really happening. Even weirder than this is the layered dreaming while awake thing I've been doing lately. Super discombobulating. It's as if I'm actually experiencing a dream state with this intense level of shifting through multiple dreams, memories of dreams while wide awake and not sleep deprived at all. Always begins with some sort of mental swoop into an acute sense of uh, deja vu, and my consciousness sort of veers off sideways into the dream world while still awake. I'm feeling a little woozy just thinking about it. Time before that, it dropped my blood pressure, and I went into a cold, dizzy sweat. I thought it was dying, uh, and felt like, whether I died or not, that this must be what dying is like, this sort of shifting of consciousness away into the dream world, which Seth says is the place we go immediately after dying. Very interesting experience once you get past any adverse physical responses. So yeah, that's uh, I've I've had stuff like that, especially when using um, meditating using the bioral stuff. Uh, we have different tones in each ear. For yeah. some for some reason that will if I use the right ones, it will cause that type of effect on me. But the shared dreaming thing is fascinating. Yeah, that's always an interesting one because you have to wonder well, like is the dream world out there or are they psychically connected yeah that's a good question what would be the distinction there true true i mean again that's with everything um mm. yeah i don't i don't know how to how to gauge that one that's uh i'm not sure if i've had any shared dreams with anyone i've definitely been able to by focusing on someone pop into their dream but i have no control over that dream like, I, I will focus on them knowing they're asleep, and then the next day they'll be like, I had this weird dream about you. And it'll be like, okay, good. That worked. Ironically, I got that idea from a King Diamond album, because there's there's a bit where his dead sister says she'll send him a dream. And I went, can you send people dreams? Is that a thing we can do? <laughs> Turns out, yes. You keep your projections to yourself. That's Matt time. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's just unconscious. Am I projecting into your dreams, Matt? No comment. <laughs> is it mostly frustration over the fact that you don't have a title for my book you're the one that should be frustrated you need to give me the title <laughs> yeah but you're doing all this amazing amazing artwork and you don't have a title put on it eh, it's okay 
I'm just slowly doing the book. Um, okay, so this is partially because of Josh. So when all this disclosure stuff kicked in, uh, we were talking about it in the Slack, and Josh pointed out that Jason Colavito was making some really good comments. And I'd never really looked at Jason's stuff. I just knew he was kind of one of those debunkers, you know, materialist type people. Yeah. But uh, as far as the disclosure stuff, he's pretty on the mark with most of it. Uh, he makes some very good observations. He did make one that was completely off. And I looked at it and went, okay, I th- you're not basing that on anything. And then he got called on it, and I think he pulled it down. Um, but he had put this up, I think, today. And uh, this is like kind of the type of stuff we've been talking about. Uh, Gizmondo's io9 published an AI generated Star Wars article that was filled with errors. Uh, a new byline showed up Wednesday on the site io9, the genre entertainment section of Gizmondo tech website. Uh, Gizmondo bot. And the site said. Gizmodo, I think. Uh, what is it? I think it's Gizmodo. You're right. It is Gizmodo. I'm not okay. sure. I was putting an N in there, I'm, like I put an R in your name. I'm just correcting you because I know that the YouTube comments are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> and the site's editorial staff appear to have not had any input or advance notice of this new AI generated story about Star Wars. The whole thing just moved. Hang on. Star Wars movies and TV shows, which is said to have been the work of the parent company. Uh, The AI-generated story was headlined, A Chronological List of Star Wars Movies and TV Shows. Among other issues, the article presents the titles in a numbered list that is not actually in chronological order. It also omits any mention of uh, Disney Plus series and or A Book of Boba Fett and lists the Clone Wars series as coming after the events of The Rise of Skywalker. Heresy. So did nobody fact check this before they put it out? It was just randomly... They just generated and yep. The, the, well, it wasn't supposed to be <laughs> random. This no, is what AI does. No, no, Taylor. Somebody was given that somebody was handed this and they were, they were told, Hey, proofread this before it goes out. And they said, oh, okay, looks good. <laughs> they like glanced yeah. at it and they put it out you, there. So yeah, somebody probably not catching wrong. the heat. Yeah, so, so, catching the heat. They, they, the, this, the, one of the people there said, uh, I was informed approximately 10 minutes beforehand, and no one at io9 played a part in its editing or publication. Wow. But this is not, I mean, this is becoming more and more common, where they're just letting AI write stuff, and AI is not particularly accurate because it's getting stuff from the internet, which is not particularly accurate. I mean, so (laughs) did it say it was a parent company that that decided to do this? Um, No. What is Gizmodo's? Oh, okay. No. Uh, the genre entertainment session of Gizmodo tech website, Gizmodo Bot, which I mean, okay. s- suggests to me that it's an AI anyway, but I don't know. Right. Huh. That's interesting. Well, I know um, a similar thing's happening with code um, right now. And we actually, it was, it was kind of surreal the other day, I uh, got an email from um, uh, some like bosses and directors and stuff, basically talking about using AI tools to help write code Mm. and encouraging us to try it and encouraging us to like, you know, be careful and make sure to check everything because it's not going to be perfect. You know, you're going to run into issues. Um, but I've actually, I've seen it, I've seen it be pretty effective and super fast. So it's, it is interesting how quickly those tools are evolving. Yeah. They're not perfect. I, have I have I ranted about AI on where do the road go? I do not. I do not believe. <clears throat> I don't believe so. Well, I was speaking with a good friend of mine, Jim Nettles, and he summarized where I think the technology is now uh, better than I think anybody else I've talked to. He says that when you you know put in something and get try to get text back out, he says there is still. And of course, this will probably get better over time, but I'm not sure if it'll ever quite go away. He, he described it as a textual uncanny valley. Uh, in the way that these things are written. Oh yeah. And I thought about that for a minute. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm cause I, cause I, you see it and you're like, this sounds like it's AI written. You can't figure out why it is. And I think that's probably as close as we're going to get to what, it, what's going on. Um, you know, I've, I've played around with it. So I, mean, I, I think that it can be a great tool for, um, you know, since I have recently dove, since I recently dove into the fictional space, I think it can be a really good tool for, uh, breaking writer's block. Um, mm. you know, I, sometimes I would have something where I like, I need a metaphor, but I can't think of it. Can you give me 10 metaphors related to this thing? And while I never used what they gave me, it would sort of be, um, I sort of ended up using it like disruptor cards. If you're familiar with that concept, those, uh, those, uh, those, uh, Eno disruptor cards that he made with, I think he made them with Bowie, um, just about sort of like, you know, breaking your train of thought and sort of like introducing ideas that you would never have thought of. So I think it's really yeah. useful in that way. 
I'm a little bit more optimistic about where we're going to end up with all this because, you know, I I can't help but see parallels to what happened with, uh, I have experience in both these areas, um, musicians and synthesizers and what happened with, uh, you know, airmen and drones because I had a member of the family who at one point was uh, a flyboy for the Navy. And, uh, you know, in both those situations, uh, the, the sort of tenor of the conversation at the time was, oh, this is going to be the end of our jobs. They're never going to need us again. And in both of those scenarios, the technology sort of got incorporated. And, yes, some jobs were lost. But at the same time, I don't know if it was quite as revolutionary no. in terms of completely clearing the field like everybody thought it would. Right. Because, you know, there's yeah. still plenty of musicians Classical musicians is more of an issue with synthesizers, right? Because you're sampling stuff. But there are plenty of musicians still employed today. Um, you know, granted, you're not <laughs> you're not uh, a rock star like Paganini was, but um, you know, you're, you're, there are still plenty of well employed classical musicians today. And I, I think that uh, you know, and obviously we still have pilots who fly traditional aircraft. So I think that it's going to change. It's, it's just, a, it's just going to be more of a matter of adopting. I do think some jobs are on the, on the, on the chopping block. And I, I don't think that the issue is necessarily AI replacing everything, but AI just sort of muddying the waters like this article does. You know, it's a, there's already a big problem with AI generated books on Amazon that are yep. just flooding the market and making it hard to stand out. So again, I'm not trying to like, I'm not trying to wear rose colored glasses in this case, but I, I do think that at least in the creative space, it should be met with a little bit less wringing of hands than it is. Um, I'm more concerned about the way that people offload responsibilities that are <laughs> much more that's, important. Than, yes, <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm mainly concerned about is people. Yeah. Is that aspect of it? Yeah. And, and we talked on a previous show about like the, the, uh, the, uh, the self help or the helpline uh, for eating disorders, and it they just fired everyone and let AI run it, and it was giving people oh awful device. And uh, you know, like, did you not think you just probably didn't care? You just figured you're saving money, so who cares? You know, um, and I think that that's part of the thing. Quality is not a part of our culture anymore. Yeah, well, so at least the company that I work at, um, where they seem to be encouraging people to use AI tools for like um, assisted programming, mm -hmm. what what it seems like is the goal would be to have, you know, people, developers who are already doing these jobs be enabled to do these jobs um, more efficiently and with, with um, you know, more of an ability to kind of expand the horizons as far as what they can do. And I, I think that it's much more likely that in this case, the developers will have a more powerful tool set than that developers will get replaced. Yeah. Um, I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. There, there was a sci-fi show was, series I was watching for the life of me. I can't remember the name of it. It was, it was okay. But at one point they're trying to write code to, to fix something. And she's basically having the AI help her as she's coding so she can do it faster. Like, and I'm thinking, okay, that's a realistic use of AI. Like you're telling, she's telling the AI, I need you to write a code to do this. And then she's just checking it as the AI is generating it. Yeah. It makes it much more, it makes, it makes the job of the developer a lot more conceptual and architectural and not have to deal with, you know, I don't have to focus so much on, do I have a semicolon at the end of this line? You know, is this indented properly, right? That kind of nitty gritty stuff, if that's yeah. taken care of. But yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I but think what this article really represents, <clears throat> excuse me, is like a lot of people, you know, just fear monger about air quote, the dangers of AI when a lot of the people spousing that are just have a vested interest in the AI industry and are trying to generate more interest in it. But like what this article really typifies is like an actual danger of AI in the sense that the errors in the article don't matter because it's not an article anyone is really expected to read. It exists right. because it has that generic enough title that people will click on it to just funnel traffic to the site. Yeah. What AI is phenomenally good at and what it will be used overwhelmingly for is just generating spam. Yeah, yeah, con yeah con totally. the, the, it's a fuel for the content mill is what, yeah, is what it is. This never ending demand for just content. I don't care if it's good or not. Just make it more content. Yes. Yeah. And you know, the flip side of this that I don't feel like people are talking about. And again, like would I prefer to live in the world where this was never, where this genie never came out of the bottle? Yes, I would. But 
I am sure that there is something that this technology, some long-standing problem, whether it's an unbreakable mathematical formula or whether it's a humanitarian issue, something good will come of this. Sure. Probably multiple good things will come of this. It's just the question of, you know, how disruptive it's going to be in the interim and, uh, you know, how much responsibility, like I said, people are offloading to it. Well, that's it. You got to get the greedy bastards who run corporate entities, you know, entities who only care about how much money they're making, not to use it the wrong way. Right. Like well. replacing, <laughs> like replacing everyone on a helpline with AI. You know, like that's that's not how you do this. I remember back there was a, uh, I don't know if it started with it, but I had for the Commodore sixty four a program called Eliza or Eliza, something like that. And it was like, I think it was the first like uh, sort of AI type of thing where it would be your, your therapist. So you, you'd ask it something and it would reform the question back to you. Kind of just real basic stuff, but it was fascinating at the time. And I kind of feel like this is just a more advanced version of that. It just searches the internet instead. Right. The best metaphor I heard for explaining the current state of AI is calling it a word calculator. <laughs> <laughs> Although I did, I did have, I did have a thought, and I'm not sure. I had some some folks who were. I put a post out on Facebook, and it was kind of bait for the kind of folks that I was hoping would respond. But it was something to the effect of, "Is the individual's relationship to the collective unconscious?" similar to um similar to humanity's relationship with in other words sorry let me start this over the collective knowledge of the internet to humanity sorry yeah yeah <laughs> let me let's scratch it ai to the collective knowledge of the internet humanity to the collective unconscious right? yeah because it's sort of a gestalt of mm. everything and i think that there's something interesting worth exploring in there but again the problem is that uh the, the the activity on the internet is just is strictly subconscious and not unconscious. You know what I mean? Um, but I think there's there's something in, it, it provides. I think a model for explaining how something like the un, the collective unconscious would look, if that makes any sense. Yeah, potentially. I think I did see you write something about that and thought that was an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, and then a lot of people who are a lot smarter than me came in and were like, "Actually, <laughs> I was like, okay, but there's there's something here, right? There's some yeah, sort no, of there is. Here. There's some sort of utility, yeah." Um, and apparently, let's, you mentioned the books they're generating, but they're also generating music with AI. Um, and uh, apparently AI art is now starting to copy other AI art. Nice. It's an Ouroboros. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> so it's like, uh, how's that, that? So, I mean, all the originality is sort of draining out of it because it's just kind of distilling it down to the same thing over and over again. Yeah, and, and I think of all the people who should be concerned about AI, it's the visual artists who are really getting the short shrift. Um, yeah. Because the, the written stuff is still not there yet. You know, it, it's like the, the the similes and metaphors that it uses are very heavy-handed, and you can, you can still tell some of the visual art has gotten shockingly good. And like I said, it's all being, you know, as with everything, it's being pilfered from, from visual artists. And I think they're the ones who have the strongest uh, reason to be upset about it. Honestly, people, yeah. people like Matt. Yeah. So like my main yeah. thought on that, which I unfortunately haven't seen too many people actually bring up is that there's no problem like with the technology in any way that it's being used in and of itself. The problem itself is capitalism. It's like just like any other form of automation. It's trying to reduce the amount of labor people have access to doing while not giving them any of the benefits of the value of that labor. Like True. Pe the reason it automates, it's such a huge issue for visual artists is because we're forced to have that stranglehold over the copyright of our work in order to make a living. If our mm. basic needs were all be provided for, it wouldn't be an issue. Yeah. True. Interesting. So um, in a complete change of subject, I had this, which I found really interesting. Uh, ayahuasca and holy water, how four missing children were found in the Amazon jungle. And uh, basically... That's the, a headline. Yeah. Um, which AI wrote that? Huh? Did you say AI wrote that? Yeah, I said which AI wrote that. <laughs> Um, so there was a 40 day search to find these missing children. Um, and, uh, the day that the four missing children in the Colombian jungle were going to be found the night before a shaman named El Rubio 
had drunk ayahuasca and had met the children in his dream. He interpreted it as a divine sign. Uh, the children, members of the indigenous community of Putameo, pushed through the jungle with w- that mystical conviction. They, they were alone. They had overtaken the soldiers, who were also taking part in the search effort, and had come up against the jungle's thick undergrowth. It was 3 p.m., a time when it was best to start returning to camp before night fell, but the children kept going. They had faith in the shaman's words. On the way, four of them ran into a turtle. A uh, little turtle, if you don't deliver the children, I'm going to eat your liver fried, Eliza told it laughing, and I'm going to drink your blood, said Nicholas, one of the, the other one of the two children. Uh, the turtle did not flinch. Eliza stepped on its back and carried it with him like a backpack. The trackers advanced another 10 meters until they reached the clearing. Here, Dario heard in the distance what seemed to be the cry of a baby. He estimated it was coming from about 50 meters away. It's the children, he had the urge to shout. The four bolted forward. Nicholas was the first to reach the children and found Leslie, the eldest, with the one-year-old baby in her arms. He gave her a hug and told her not to be afraid, and they were indigenous people from Putumeo, and they had been looking for them for weeks. Uh, so I guess those were the people looking for her that were talking to the turtle, I suppose. It's, ri- it's not... It's turtle. It's not, it's not initially written in English, so the translation's a little off. Okay. Um, but yeah, so apparently him, him doing the ayahuasca uh, connected with the kids and helped uh, save them. What was the holy water, though? Didn't it say ayahuasca yes, and holy water? Yes, it did. This is a really long article, and I didn't, didn't see anything about holy water. Uh, uh, the oh. indigenous rescuer is grateful to the gods for finding the children. Blue Tobacco as an offering to the jungle and sprinkle the children with holy water. So yeah. I think it was just a catchy title. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because it it's just another story to throw on the heap of inaccessible knowledge acquired during these states. Um, yeah. And I think it's, I think it's, you know, the ones that you always hear or the ones that you hear most often are about learning of the death of someone prior to, you know, word reaches word reaching you in the, you know, in our waking realm. Yeah. Um, but this is kind of interesting to have that from a, from a different angle with a happier ending. I like it. Yeah, it's definitely it's, an interesting story, and uh, it it also suggests that you know that information is accessible, that or that we are able to that it's something real. I guess is what I'm trying to say, which I think we know, but you know, the materialist society just dismisses this stuff as hallucin- hallucinations. Yeah, the the term that the near death community would use um, is veridical. It has that sort of exterior validity that you can verify. Um, yeah. What, uh, what website or what, um, what did this come through the story? Uh, I no longer have it in front of me. Do you Josh? Yeah. I, I found it at El Pais, uh, English.elpais.com. E L P A I S.com. Okay. Hmm. So let's take a quick break. Um, and we'll be right back. Okay. Quick mid show break here. I'm going to give you a recommendation and also, uh, I'll give you some contact info. Everything can be found at wheredidtheroadgo.com. That is, that is the easiest contact info right there. All the email addresses, social media, everything right there. Wheredidtheroadgo.com. If you want to become a patron and help us out, it's only $3 a month. I recommend uh, becoming a patron earlier in the month rather than later because it does charge at the beginning of every month. Just, just a, a heads up to people. Um, yeah, and you get extra stuff every single month. Almost every single week. Yeah. So um, if you have a story you want to share, stories at wheredoftheroadgo.com is the place to email them. Uh, even if you don't want them read on the air, just let me know. And, you know, if you just want me to comment on something or ask a question about something that's happened to you, that's the best place to, to go with that email. All right. Um, recommendation. Something we sort of uh, mentioned in the past. Uh, there's a couple of movies done by Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. Uh, resolution and endless, and they kind of interconnect. And uh, the first one's a little bit of a slow burn, and the second one is about a UFO cult and is far less of a slow burn, uh, and a lot more on the high strangeness. But uh, these guys, the stuff they do is is sort of in line with a lot of the stuff we talk about here. I mean, obviously fictionalized, but uh, they take things off in different directions. And I absolutely love it. So if you have not seen those, Resolution came out in 2012, and The Endless came out in 2017. So if you have not seen those and you like high strangeness movies, those are the two to check out. I believe they're both included with Amazon Prime if you have it. Yeah, 
Go watch them. And uh, it's it's a really bizarre viewing experience. All right, back to the show. So you are listening to Where Did the Road Go? And I am here with Joshua Cutchin Taylor. Is there another name there? Taylor. Uh, not, on, not on Skype. Okay. And Matt Festa for the first time. Hello, hello. And uh, so I had this. So I was looking up. You remember the 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 footprints, like the devil's footprints in England? Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember exactly where they were, uh, but they were a series of like uh, that showed up overnight in the snow and like went up and down houses and stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. like in a straight line, just like yep. regardless of what was in its way. Yeah, and, and the explanation, one of the explanations was uh, was like a uh, was like a mouse tied to a balloon or something. Yeah, something like, <laughs> like that. Just the most <laughs> absurd. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I was trying to look that the name of that up, and I found the Devil's Horses of Prince, which was in North Carolina. And it says Devil's Horses of Prince near Bath are a series of small saucer-shaped depressions reportedly in existence since 1813. Measuring four to five inches deep with sloping sides from six to ten inches, the holes to remain a source of one of North Carolina's most famous and enduring mysteries. Legend relates that on a Sunday morning about church time, of course, uh, Jesse Elliott and some companions planned to race their horses along the main street of Bath. Elliott mounted and spurred his horse, and as it raced off, he leaned forward, shouting in its car, take me in a, take me in a winter or take me to hell. Promptly, the d- horse dug its hooves into the soft earth, throwing Elliott against the tree and killing him instantly. Some believe that the horse was actually the devil in the form of a horse. Tradition maintains that the holes, located just off North Carolina 1334, about 3.5 miles of ba- uh, west of Bath, have survived every known attempt to permanently eradicate or alter them. Although the holes are located at the edge of a forested area, no vegetation grows inside them. None of the pine needles from the thick mat surrounding the hole ever remains in the earthen saucers. On their way to school, children have deposited various kinds of debris into the depressions only to find that the holes are empty upon their return from school. Countless visitors to the site have experienced the same phenomena. Scientists have conducted uh, studies at the site to provide an objective explanation of the intriguing holes. Among the most popular theories are that the depressions are vents for a subterranean water pocket or the result of salt veins. And I'm, I'm looking at this article right here, and it says that the author is Dan Barefoot, whom my father has corresponded with, and who has written some excellent books on uh, the Civil War, if memory serves. Um, I'm, I'm from North Carolina, and I'm surprised that I had not heard of this, Soraya. Um, yeah, I had not heard of it either. I, like I said, I was looking up the, the other stuff from England, and I'm like, wait, what's this? So, like, what are the... Is it just like regular soil that the indentations are in, or what are? It sounds what are that way, yeah. Like, it's like, it looks like like hmm. the based on the picture, they're almost like a forest floor. Yeah, just foliage and hmm. dirt. Um, man, yeah, and and, and so if, for those of you who don't know, Bath is down there on the coast. It was um, once uh, home of Edward Teach. Um, who was famously the pirate Blackbeard, and Blackbeard's home is still there in Bath. Um, so it's kind of a, a strange area to begin with, um, hmm. down all, all there along the coast. And like I said, I'm surprised I hadn't heard about this. I guess maybe I'd seen it before and I just always assumed that it was talking about the devil's tromping ground, which is, um, a spot. There are a couple of them. I think there's one actually, uh, somewhere near lookout mountain in uh, at the Tennessee, Georgia border as well. But the one in North Carolina, I believe is sort of in the, the triangle area, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill kind of area. Um, and it's just this patch of, of earth that remains similarly barren. And it's said that you can leave trash there and the trash will just disappear the next day. Hmm. Um, but Aww. this is this is new to me. Um, thank you, Sarah. I'm, <laughs> I'm eternally grateful you filled in a gap in my North Carolina knowledge. <laughs> it's very in interesting, it, like classic folklore. Now, now yeah. you have to go personally investigate, you realize. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been to Bath numerous times. I love that, that part of the state. Um, I'm going to have to, yeah. So it, it describes them as saucer-shaped depressions? What I mean, I mean they're they're like this they're like the size of a horse's hoof though. I mean they're not huge. Um, but like circular and rounded. I guess the picture's really small and I can't quite make it out. Yeah, and there's not yeah, a lot of info on it. Yeah, you'd think maybe like gopher holes or something or some sort of rodent activity. Um, let's see here. But they only go so like deep. How, so yeah, I was gonna say like how deep could they be? Isn't this a mystery you could solve with a bag of potting soil and a trail cam? Yeah. Yeah, it's four to five inches. 
with sloping sides from six to ten inches. Which is a decent size. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, it's not terribly small. Um, yeah, and I mean, like, it's not quite the same thing as the, the, the devil's hoof prints or whatever from, from the UK. Um, but no, that's, because those were transitory, yeah. Yeah, those were in the mm-hmm. snow. Like, for a moment, I thought I was looking at the, at the same, you know, this, that I had found this, the same thing. And then I'm going, wait, no, this is not, this is not, I've never heard of this. This is just some weird Fortiana. Yeah, and, and relatively unique, I think, in Fortiana. Um, the idea of something that, like I said, the, the idea of a spot like that, that sort of self-maintains. Um, yeah. Is not one that you come across a lot, with the exception of something like the Devil's Tramping Ground. Um, and and they're talking, too, about, like, you know, stuff being put there and then leaving, and maybe it's a vent or something. It's like, but, I mean, couldn't you just hang out and see? I'm just trying to think. I mean, it's not like it's a volcanic area. Now, now I'm looking at some some an, another uh, newscast that did sort of a short story on it, and it looks like they're more dinner plate sized here. Um, and honestly, it looks like it could be a small bedding mammal of some sort, but well, yeah, that's odd. And, but why would it only be there? Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. It, may, it makes me think of that, that one UFO story and Josh, maybe, you know, remember what I can't, I can never remember what the case was where the UFO came down in their woods. Um, like the woman touched it and it like, she never could feel her arm again. Uh, but it left a permanent like dead spot on the ground that nothing would ever grow on. I mean, I, f- I feel like there have been a couple of cases with aspects of that. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, it was, uh, I know that there's some stories of the Brown mountain lights when they've been approached in North Carolina, uh, on the other end of North Carolina, <laughs> nowhere near the devil's footprints. Um, where they've sort of left these lingering effects of temporary paralysis. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, people who've gotten in close proximity have have to all sorts of plasmoids, but the the, the brown mountain lights, I think, have done that as well. Um, you know, it's interesting. I I I, uh, I believe there's also a similar story um, from uh, Claude Lecouteau's Phantom Armies of the Night, and anybody who is like anybody who's followed me long enough knows that I'm an avid Claude Lecouteau fan. Um, they're my favorite UFO books that aren't about UFOs. Uh, form, former Sorbonne uh, history, former Sorbonne medievalist uh, is what he is, and he retired and started writing books about just theories and all this stuff. And you can tell that he puts some stock in its, its reality. But one of the things that he mentions is during a procession of the wild hunt, one of the members of the wild hunt touches someone's arm and their arm is useless afterwards. Huh. And uh, the area was burned around it, I believe as well. So it kind of puts me in the mindset of that. Interesting. Yeah. It does sound similar. That kind of stuff always reminds me of like the type of thing I would expect from like radiation, but I don't, I Maybe. have no idea. And, I don't know if radiation even behaves that way, but just the the idea that something could so drastically affect like living things, right? So like living tissue or plants and stuff like that, like permanently or or at like a long term kind of basis. Well, so could I would think something electrical, like the brown mountain lights sure. being plasma or something like that, might have a strong enough effect on an elect- on you know a living things electrical field or leave an electrical field there that it might continue to uh, not allow things to grow. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, this is sort of is a, a question that the nuts and bolters have uh, investigated ad nauseum, and you know, I applaud them for it because it's definitely a question of you know whether or not people are experiencing ionizing versus non-ionizing radiation, and I can never quite remember the difference between the two. <laughs> but um, I know that that was definitely the topic of discussion regarding the uh, the, the Cash Landrum case. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the, to me, the Cash Landrum case seems more like uh, military. <laughs> Oh, I, I agree, but it's it's a it's interesting how those after effects um, sometimes look like UFO after effects as well. Uh, one of my favorite stories that I have run across recently, and I can't remember. I think this was in a. Uh, uh, I think it was in a Greg Little book. Um, has Greg Little ever been on the show, sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, and oh, the recently, last he was on. With, yeah. End of last year. That's right, because of the Andrew Collins book. Um, yeah. You mentioned a case of someone who had experienced uh, adverse physiological effects from a UFO encounter, and over the course of hypnotic regression, 
those effects uh, manifested themselves once more. That's interesting. Dur- during the course of the, re- hmm. the uh, during the course of the regression, which yeah, is is super interesting to me. <laughs> and that's the yeah, thing. It is. It's not. It's not like terribly surprising to me. Right. Um, exactly. But yeah. That's that's really interesting though. The uh, the fact that hypnosis can do stuff like that is utterly fascinating, and and again shows yeah. how little we know about this stuff. Uh, and unfortunately, some people take it as oh no no, no just 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 recalls memories. <laughs> well, right, and, and that's sort of the that's sort of the the dance that I try to do when I talk about hypnosis is that I think it I think it has some sort of value, and that I, I think that it's. I think that it's well, you know, there are plenty of people who just toss it out, and I think that they I toss know. out. The, I think that they toss out the baby with the bathwater. I think that there's some 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 sort of utility to it, and I think that it's somehow tied to this phenomenon. But I but I don't think that the generally accepted way that people like to think of it is actually what's happening. It's not it's not memory retrieval. I think it's probably. I suspect that it's probably more putting you in the same realm that you were when you encountered this thing. <laughs> I think it's probably more, yeah. you know, the experience happens again in, re- in real time or something along those lines. Yeah. Which, which demonstrates that there's something to consciousness. Obviously there's plenty of things to consciousness we don't understand, but there's something to it that we're able to at least marginally affect and, and tap into kind of what's, what's happening in somebody's conscious experience that it seems can also have effects on physical things or, or effects on the body, you know, whatever, whatever those are. Yeah. Well put. Yeah. There was a case, uh, I think Stephanie Quick brought it to my attention. Uh, there was a bus, and I think, I think if I remember right, there, we, if, this just sounds weird, but I think this is what happened. Someone had uh, taken a school bus full of children and buried it, uh, and no one knew where it was. Oh, God. And, and they hypnotized this guy who saw it but didn't remember enough details, and what he remembered was enough for them to find the bus. And so I looked at that and I went, okay, here's a case where hypnosis, we can prove remembered accurate details that the guy didn't otherwise remember. So it's like, okay, but does that work the same way that remote viewing does? Because we know if a remote viewer is given feedback, they're more accurate than if they're not given feedback. In fact, if they're not given feedback, your accuracy drops considerably. So I just did a quick search for, um, because I'm, I'm trying to think of how much effort it would take to bury a school bus. Um, it looks like there was the 1976 Chowchilla kidnapping. Could have been. I don't Chowchilla, remember. Chowchilla, it was uh, 26 children aged 5 to 14 that were put into a box truck and buried in a quarry in Livermore. But the Wikipedia article doesn't say anything about hypnosis. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But interesting. Um, but like, why? Yeah, I don't know. Why, why do people so do weird. a lot of things? I guess I don't know. It was it was they were they were it was, apparently they wanted a ransom, huh? Uh, but according to this, the driver and children dug themselves out, so it might not be the same case. But that's, yeah, I didn't even know that was a thing. Bearing, yeah, that's I'm no criminal mastermind, but I don't think that's how you get ransom money, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you didn't know what it was a thing. Friends, I, I I really wish it wasn't a thing. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's one of those it's one of those things that when you learn about it, it kind of makes you feel better about yourself as a human being because you never thought of that being a possibility. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. That's so weird. Like, oh, you didn't know about burying kids? Oh my god. Um. All right. So we have a, a few minutes left. I wanted to throw this out because uh, last time I did an AMA show, someone uh, threw out the oh, question. I actually yeah. actually found it. <laughs> Sorry, oh, okay. I actually found it. Cool. Um, uh, it's, it's just a paragraph on a website, but it seems to be about that case. Uh, Kroger and Deuce, uh, 1979 report a number of intriguing cases in which this technique was used. In one case, 26 school children and a bus driver were abducted at gunpoint and brought to a rock quarry where they were sealed in an underground tomb. This says the driver and two older boys managed to escape and contact the police. The driver's memory of what happened was sketchy while captive he had tried to see the license plate number but didn't want to look too long for fear of getting caught under hypnosis. It was suggested to him that he was sitting in his favorite chair, watching the event unfold on a documentary. He was able to remember all, but one of the license plate numbers. And because of his help, the kidnappers were tracked by the FBI and arrested. But even still in that case, this is me now. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a memory retrieval, right? It's almost like remote viewing an incident. Well, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like there's, there's similarities there. Yeah. So, I mean, who knows what's really going on? But, I mean, it, okay, it, it, you could say that's a memory retrieval, you know, yeah, under, under hypnosis. Yeah. Um, so I, want, I wanted to close this off real quick. Um, really simple question. Uh, Claire 
Carrie had this. This was a few months ago, like I said. Uh, what's your favorite book on the paranormal? <laughs> well, um, I, I just had um, I just had to put together a short list for a website that sort of spotlights authors, and they ask them their favorite books on a topic. And I picked five books that to help you rethink UFOs and the paranormal was Ooh. the topic that I chose. Okay, and they're all real predictable for me, right? So it's um, Patrick Harper's Demonic Reality. Yep. Uh, uh, Passport to Magonia by Jacques Vallée. Right. Uh, da, 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 uh, uh, what about this? What's wrong with you, Josh? George P. Hansen's Tricks from the Paranormal. Yep. Uh, and then after that, it's kind of a sharper fall off for me. Um, I put The Supernatural by uh, Whitley Strieber and Jeff Kripal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I think it sort of nests his experiences in dialogue with uh, with the religious experience, which I think is a way that it serves some utility for people to think about this stuff. Definitely. And then I ended up throwing a, a, a wild, uh, a, a sort of a, I was going to mix metaphors there. I threw in a wild card, um, which was Ian McDonald's King of Morning, Queen of Day, which is a fictional book, but it's a fictional book that I think is one of the best depictions of, uh, of fairies ever put in a book. Um, okay. And it's a lovely book that I should probably reread at some point because I loved it so much. Um, I, I would agree with definitely the first four. I've never read the fifth, uh, but I, instead of ga- instead of passport to Magonia, I would actually go with dimensions, mm. uh, just because I, I think dimensions takes a wider, you know, like, like that's the more important book because that's where valet came up with the idea. It's where he first presented it, but dimensions is where he takes that idea and really expands on it brings in things like Fatima and other stuff like that and, and looks at it on an even wider scope. Uh, and I would say for my fifth, maybe uh, I just had it in my head and now it's gone. I mean, that Joshua Cutchin guy writes some really good books I've liked. Um, <laughs> Never heard of them. Yeah, yeah they're, they're obscure, but they're really good. Uh, How do you spell that? Was it, did you say Crutchin? Yeah, Crutchin. Uh, Crutchin yeah, yeah. Right. I'll, I'll look them up. Jo- Joshua yeah. Crutchin. Um, like oh, Keel. Like uh, the Eighth Tower yeah. from Kiel, that yes. that would be my other one. Uh, close, close, closely followed by the Mothman prophecies. Yeah. So I'm going to jump into this real quick. I actually would also say Eighth Tower and Mothman prophecies. Um, although I really loved the Eighth Tower when I first read it, when I revisited it, I didn't love it quite as much. Really? See, I was the um, opposite way. Okay. Well, I, I haven't I haven't fully reread it, but I was I was basically going back through it and skimming some sections because I was doing some research. Um, and I was. Uh, it wasn't quite as coherent as it was in my memory, oh, um, okay. but I, I should, I should revisit it at some point. Um, but then, uh, uh, the other three I, I would put, um, because I have not read a ton of, uh, paranormal related books. Um, but I will, I will go ahead and say where the footprints end in an ecology yeah. of souls. Cause I think those are, I think those are both fantastic. Oh, um, shucks, y'all. I guess that's technically four books, right? Between the two of those. It's true. But, yeah, I always have trouble when people ask me how many <laughs> books I've written because I never intended to split any, any of those apart. But that's what it is, I guess. It happens. Uh, and then I would also throw on Light Quest, which is one I, I had oh, heard of. Andrew, uh, Andrew from Collins. Eastern. Yes. Yeah. Um, I I discovered that we uh, sold it at the bookstore I used to work at, and I picked it up after I heard you mention it on some podcast somewhere. And I really liked that one. It was that was a fascinating read. Yeah, I think that I talked to Andrew about that the first time he came on. Okay, yeah, it's a plasma intelligence is, is sort yeah. of an explanation for UFOs. It's, it's, and, it's, it's good thinking, and there's some really great stories in there. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if it's the answer to to any of it, but right. there's but some of it definitely is on mark. It's a very creative way to explore yeah. those kinds of phenomena. Yeah. It's, it's fun. I, I think I had a problem with his bubble universe idea as for being the, the interaction point. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I don't, I feel like that was the piece I had. I was like, I don't know about that, but a lot of the plasma intelligence stuff works nicely. Yeah. So Matt. So anything that I could think of is just going to be the very obvious titles that anyone listening to this is already going to be well that's familiar a, that's with. That's okay. So I think that, like, at least from my point of view, books specifically about the paranormal in a lot of instances aren't as explicitly valuable in terms of, like, changing and opening the way people can just think about these things as Mm -hmm. seemingly completely unrelated fiction books can. Oh, yeah. Like some of the most just like novels that like, you know, left lights on in all the right corridors of my mind to like take me in these interesting directions 
yep. would be The Book of the New Sun by Gene Wolfe, mm. which just, it called Book of the New Sun, but it's five separate novels. And it is just like so, I mean, I can't even give a summary of the actual plot because I'd be here for an hour, but it's like unrelated to anything overtly paranormal. But the way he discusses and describes different phenomena and the way the characters just conceptually approach it has done so much more to like broadening my horizon in terms of like how to think about these things and my life itself as well. Than like anything, you know, even phenomenal ones like communion or any of those. Yeah, that that that's a very good point. I mean, uh, I, I resonate with that so strongly because like some of the best revelations that I've had about pet theories or pet ideas of mine have come from just places that I would never have expected, like complete left field. Um, which is why, like you know, I I I really value the the paranormal or the supernatural as sort of a gateway drug to making you go to museums and read about things you never thought you'd want to read about. Oh yeah, they, they can. There are these things like you said. I love what you, the analogy that you use, like lighting up a pathway or something that you said just now. Um, because it really does just point you in a completely different direction that you would have never considered if you were just reading books about Bigfoot and Dogman and you know UFO <laughs> and stuff. So yeah, the the, the <laughs> thing about fiction is it isn't constrained by having to fit facts or psych cases, you can just play with an idea. And whereas they may not be trying to solve something, playing with that idea allows you different perspectives on that subject that otherwise you may not have thought about. It's also a great way of grappling with what just in my own mind, I've started to call the absurdity paradox, where like you can have the most profound life-changing experience but just trying to like flatly explain to someone will sound completely absurd and have like no meaning to them whatsoever. Whereas if you talk about like just how it affected you and that you can get that point across, but like only in terms so vague, just by virtue of distancing itself from like the literal experience of what it was, that that itself can like lose some of the meaning of it. But through the humanities and like turning something like that, just like the effect it had on you into fiction, you can like so completely recontextualize it and express it in a way that like can make it accessible to others. Yes, absolutely. That is a beautiful way of putting it. Um, Thank you. I like uh, one of the things I liked about Michael Rutger's book, uh, the second anomalies book, is that he came up with just really novel ways of looking at paranormal phenomena. And in this case, the strange walls that that exist on the West Coast that nobody can. Well, they explain it as farmers' walls, but they don't make any sense as farmers' walls. Um, and there are some on the East Coast as well. Well, Those you know, stone walls. They're what? The stone walls. The people. They're, they're stone walls, but they like go up hills. They're yeah. not high enough to actually keep uh, like animals in or anything. Some of them are just little sections. Uh, but in the book, uh, very minor spoiler that they're they're used more as sigils in the landscape. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. nice. Well, you know, at, at the risk of spinning this off into its own <laughs> its own episode, uh, somebody that I someone that I neglected to mention that I probably should have both on my list and in this discussion is is the work of Mike Cleland. Um, oh yes, not only his his Messengers book, which I think is still one of the most important UFO books, but um, his new uh, fictional novel, The Unseen. Which uh, I just got yesterday. It's, it's really it's really enjoyable, and it's um it it uh, what's, what's what's the right way to put this? Um, it reminds me a lot of something like anybody who watched Raised by Wolves on HBO Max. Um, I watched that sh that TV series, and it didn't always make sense to me in terms of what was happening in the plot, but it made sense to me on like this intuitive archetypal level. And I feel like Mike's novel, The Unseen, is kind of in the same vein because it's a lot of the stuff you're like oh this makes sense but it's the sort of things that are usually avoided in paranormal fiction because it is more like the actual phenomenon but it it's not as tidy as a lot of people want to make fiction and, and there's some Good. real bravery in, in mike for going in that direction yeah well you and you and i will be talking to mike about that soon um yes and raised by wolves that's the one with the androids raising the children yeah it was canceled after two seasons um i hated it and i absolutely hated it Oh, I adored it. I adored it. Oh, man, I adored it. I uh, I was actually shocked that it got a second season. I was like, really? All the stuff you canceled? You gave that one a second season? But it's <sighs> clearly because of you, Josh. So Agree to disagree, <laughs> sir. I agree to disagree. Absolutely. It just didn't didn't click with me at all. 
Well, as as a wise man, I know what's said. There are good things that you like and good things that you don't <laughs> like and bad things that you like and bad things that you don't like. So there you go. Yeah, I, I confused someone recently. I'd watched the movie uh, Mr. Nobody, and it's a very good movie. Yes. It's very interesting in the way the concept basically is this guy can remember not not his entire life, but also all the the uh, points where things could have been different. So he's seeing like this multiverse of lives and it's incredibly well done. It's well acted. It's well written. It's well shot. And I absolutely hated it. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. That I, I've seen that movie so many times and I don't think if my life depended on it, I don't think I could really explain it to anybody. No. No, it's, it's so weird. It just, it, I, I think part of it is it felt more like a romantic drama and oh, less, totally. less like sci-fi. And I was just kind of like, it just left me kind of cold. And, but, I'm, but at the same time, I'm like, this was an excellent movie. And so I'm saying, yeah. I'm talking to, you know, someone's asking me, I'm like, oh yeah, it's a great movie, blah, blah, blah. Then I got to know when I hated it. And they're like, wait, how could you hate it if it's good? I'm like, I'm allowed <laughs> to hate things that are good. It has no bearing on whether I like it or not. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it's a really well made movie. The soundtrack is phenomenal. The acting's even pretty good. Yeah, in, in at least most of it. The plot is very confusing. Um, it is it, yes and no. I mean, I followed what they were going for, so it bears some, say, it bear, bears some resemblance to Cloud Atlas, but on a different yes. level. The, the more I watched it, the more I realized I didn't understand what was happening. Um, <laughs> I, I've probably seen it seven or eight times. Um, most of which was in college when uh, a oh, friend okay. of mine showed it to me. And each time, like new things would kind of be revealed or like I would realize certain things about that, about that movie that made me kind of question what was actually happening. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I can see it, that. it holds a special place in my heart, at least for like emotive reasons, like watching it, you know, it's just, it's a movie that I, I would watch for like the feeling that it gives me as opposed to like the, well, the, you know, the plot itself or, or right, like that. right, right. All right, we are out of time, so let's uh, let's go through. Taylor, where can people find your stuff? Well, uh, for for a while here, um, I've been really hard at work on a podcast called Stories and Lies. So if you look up Stories and Lies, you can find that it is a Delta Green actual play podcast. So that's the that's the big thing right now. What about your tarot deck? Um, that uh, it probably is still available uh, at sigilarconomtarot.com um, or sigilarconom.com rather. Um, otherwise, on Kickstarter, I think there's a link to it as well. Okay, uh, Joshua. Josh, there, Josh. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I was on mute. I was on mute. I was using the I was using the <laughs> fart button. Um, I can be found at joshuacutchin.com. J O S H U A C U T C H I N, just like a cut on your chin. Dot com. Uh, lots of exciting stuff going on. Uh, Ecology of Souls turns one year old in a couple of days as of this recording. My new uh, compilation of fairy essays uh, that I edited with uh, some a real rogues gallery of contributors, fairy films, is available now. And soon I will be announcing more details about the release in the next couple of months, knock on wood, of my first fiction novel and we'll see fictional novel um Ooh. i guess it's sort of redundant but i always like to make sure that people know it's right, fictional right um that'll be coming out uh soon i'm just in the process of doing some editing on that and we'll see if it stinks so there you go well now that it, i've been waiting for ecology to turn a year old so i can have you on to talk about it the anniversary uh, yeah. i like that <laughs> and uh, mr matt festo where can people find your amazing artwork well mostly you can find me online at last exit for the lost because i'm there far more frequently than i post artwork <laughs> but that's true for anyone interested in my artwork when i manage to finish something once a year or so it is on Instagram and Facebook, both of them under my studio name, Tiamat's Garden. All right. Thank all of you. This has been great. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I want to give a big thank you here to everyone who supports this show by becoming a Patreon. And I want to give a special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Illuminati, Greg Ross, Leanne Cherry, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Matthew Sproul, Andrew Nichols, Christine, a blue second-gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy and Communicable, Chris, Chris Cicernos, Craig Parmenter, Diane B., Empty K., Eric Todd, History and Coffee, J., J. Otto Bullet, Jack Huntington, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Mattingly, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L., 
Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linda, Linz Jackson K, Luke Osborne, MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Schmooples, Devourer of Mortal Souls, Oli Andre Olar, Paul Jeffries, Philosopher of Mirrors, Riker and Stark, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Seed Person One, Stacy Sherwood, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Varush K, Vincent Trewell, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Annabelle Smith, Caroline Walker, TDT, Skunkworks, and Craig Sagastumi. Thank you all so very, very much for helping make this show possible. There is a Patreon segment for this show that will be up later in the week for Patreons. Uh, if you want to become a patron, please consider it, because it helps us out greatly keeping this show alive. It's only $3 a month, and you get extra content all month long. Every week, usually an extra segment, and then some other stuff thrown in as well. All right, a uh, huge thank you to Greg Ross, who uh, updated to a sponsorship of the show. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, also, uh, a, a thanks to Cody Plant for a nice donation. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and I love this, Schmooples, Devourer of Mortal Souls, has moved up to the $10 uh, plateau on Patreon. And I get to now say, Schmooples, Devourer of Mortal Souls. So thank you for that, too. All right. And I'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>